So I'm going to go Zachariah on you. Zachariah 4. Don't try and turn to it. You might never find it. Not that anybody turns these days. We tap, don't we? We tap. Tapping's easier than turning when it comes to Zachariah. Zachariah, I'm going to read to you from chapter 4, verse 10, New International Version, where God said to Zachariah, Do not despise the day of small things or small beginnings. For when the capstone is put in place, there will be great rejoicing. The context here is that Israel, God's people, the Jews, had been in captivity in Babylon, modern-day Iraq, for 70 years, almost three generations. Zechariah was one of the first returning exiles, and he was a priest. He was a leader. And God gave him a commission that God knew would be difficult. The title of this message is, do not despise small beginnings. Do not despise the days of small beginnings. Because that's what God knew Zechariah was about to do. Imagine to be in Zechariah's shoes for a moment, to sympathize with him so that we're not too harsh on him as a leader needing this to be said to him. Because he's returning from exile to a Jerusalem that had been destroyed and demolished and burnt by invading Iraqi Syrian armies. And so Jerusalem was a mess. So returning to their homeland, it required a complete rebuilding of the infrastructure of the country, literally, physically, materially. Imagine being commissioned by God to rebuild the temple, to rebuild Jerusalem when you are a returning broke exile. You have no money. You have no team. There's no architects. They're all in captivity too. There's no tradesmen. They are all in captivity too. There's no trade agreements. There's no import relationship. That's all stopped because 70 years on, all of, those, all of those building, getting things done relationships are gone. So to be in his shoes for a moment, this was a big ask. To be asked to head up the restoration of the temple, to rebuild the temple was his commissioning. God said to him after God taught him to go ahead and begin that process. And by the way, Zechariah, tap on the shoulder. Do not despise this time, these days of small beginnings. Now, if God told him and God's telling us humans to not despise small beginnings, it must be because God knows something about beginnings that we don't. What God knows about beginnings that we don't is that beginnings are despicable. They are notoriously difficult. And would have been, for all the reasons I mentioned about Zachariah, his beginnings were very complex, very difficult, as are many of yours today. And I want to talk about this because I want to say to any of you that I, any kind of beginning at all in your life, some of you are beginning a new business. You're stepping out, risking being an entrepreneur. You don't want to work for anyone else. You want to work for you that's a big step away from the security and stability of a job and a salary. You've decided to go on your own, even against advice from your friends and family. You've stepped out. It's rough. It's a, it's a new beginning. It's fragile. It's scary. Some of you are in the beginning of a new relationship, and it's fragile and a bit wobbly. You're in the beginnings of a, a relationship. It could be a friendship or a partnership in a business. It could be a courtship that may lead to engagement to marriage. It's a difficult time. Beginnings of any kind are fragile and difficult. Maybe in the beginnings of a new season of your life, which isn't a relationship, you've just come out of a divorce or come out of a separation. And so for you, you're in a new beginning when you didn't thought you'd have to have one anymore of that kind. You've come out of one relationship and now you're not in a relationship. So that is as well its own kind of beginning of a new season of you being on your own more. How will you do that? Some of you are at the begin, beginning of recovery from something. You're recovering from a life-controlling habit. You're recovering from an addiction. You're recovering from something in your life that has been damaging and harmful. And you now decided, I'm going to set a path to get away from this. And it's the early stages of your recovery from something. And it's difficult and fragile and unstable. 
That's why God said to him, and I think that's why God continues to say to us as humans, you need to be careful that you do not despise the beginnings that you are in of any kind, because if you despise beginnings, you lose the value of what is hidden in a beginning. Some of you are new parents, like I saw up here this morning. So we are in a beginning of being a parent, and that's scary, and that's difficult, and that's sleepless nights, and that's stuff you never had to deal with before. Whatever the kind of beginning it is, it strikes me that God is obsessed with beginning small. Consider how we all started life. Microscopic. I just don't know whether Jesus is rubbing it in and making a point when he chooses to use a mustard seed to make the point. There are bigger seeds than mustard seeds. Some seeds, I've studied seeds, some seeds are as big as a football. Literally. What if he'd have mentioned a seed that when we Googled it 2,000 years later, it came up like a football? And we thought, well, at least the seed is big enough to look like a beginning. A mustard seed doesn't look like the beginning of anything that has any potential at all. And so Jesus deliberately uses the metaphor, the analogy of this tiny if you've never handled a mustard seed, I mean, that is a mustard seed on the graphic I showed you, but you need to get one between, between your thumb and forefinger and realize how tiny and pathetic and pitiful and, and, and non able to be called a beginning of anything a mustard seed is. And Jesus said, if you've got faith the size, the beginning size of a mustard seed, then you can move big things in your life, clearly pointing out that faith is about quality, not quantity, which we've made it about. So he's fascinated, God is committed to, God is pledged to continue to speak to us and lead us through new beginnings and he's warning us and I'm warning you today in whatever beginning you are in because some of you came here today and you are ready to quit. Not long since you began, but you're a year, you're two, you're three years in and it's so bad, it's so tough that you're thinking about quitting and you've come today and the rest of Hillsong and the rest of the network that are going to hear this, I want to say to all of you, you are on the verge of quitting, and God sent me perhaps to say to you, whoa, 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 hang on a minute, hang on. Don't think just because beginnings are tough, it must mean that God's not with you, or God's not in it. And what, and what, you, what you can't do, I haven't got time, I'm watching my clock, I haven't got time for clapping. <laughs> Though I do like it, but I haven't got time, so... Yeah, if you, if you want to clap and I'll let you go, I'll just stop you depending on my clock here, which you can't see. Thank you. We'll allow a bit of clapping time later on for the big finish. I hope. Now, what you mustn't do in your beginning is you mustn't compare your chapter 1 to someone's chapter 20. So that's not helping you at all, some of you. That is messing you up. Because some of you are hanging out with people whose beginning was years ago and now they're established and they're flowing and got momentum you're at the beginning you shouldn't be hanging out with them because they're doing your heading and they make it easy and effortless and you are so when you're with them you feel so discouraged and you, the opposite was supposed to happen because when you compare where you are with where someone else is that you want to be you kind of think I'll never make it I'm just going to quit now. I'll never ever have that. And this is the gift. This is the gift of small beginnings. The gift of small beginnings is it helps you figure you out. Small beginnings are brilliant because in small beginnings, you find out more than you ever will in the middle or the end. You're going to find out in small beginnings who your mates are, who your friends are. People who stick with you in a beginning are keepers. Anybody wants to be with you in the middle or the end when now we want to hang out with you. Now you have money and resources and network and influence and relationship and momentum. Now you have kudos. Now we want to hang out with you and be your friends. But people that want to be your friends when none of that is going for you, people that want to stick with you when you've got nothing to offer them, in fact, it's a disadvantage for them to stick with you. It costs them. You, it's not that you forget your wallet. You haven't got one. You just don't have any money anymore to go to dinner or treat anybody or go to the movies. All of that you've given up because your beginnings are so painful and you are so kind of penny pinching because that's the stage of life you're at. One of my son-in-laws decided two years ago to quit his job as a printer and go and start his own business. And he's very creative and so on and so on. But a lot of creative people have no brains. 
they're creative. And, and so they think because they're creative and have ideas, they think a good idea equals a good business. And it doesn't always. Sometimes a good idea is a bad business. So my son-in-law, and because he's heard me preach for years, empowering people, go for it. I'm not going to not say that to my own family. The difference is, if I say to my own family, go for it, go for it, I believe in you. The difference in my own family is, I might finish up paying their mortgage. You know what I'm saying? So now it's cl closer to home. Now saying go for it, quitting his job, may put my daughter and my grandchildren in hardship because I encourage their dad and husband to go for it. But because I am not a fair weather friend, and this is not my Sunday persona, because this is what I believe in life, I said to my son-in-law, go for it. How can I help you? I gave him a gift. Um, he said, let's call it a business loan. I said, no, let's call it what it is. I know I'll never see that money again. <laughs> so let's not, let's not pretend. Uh, you just, just have it. Just keep it. So, so I gave him a business loan to help to, to show I was really serious about believing in him. Uh, and more recently, uh, another business loan. And it's, you know, two, three years in. But the point is, I, I empowered him, I encouraged him, and I know he struggled, and I know my family have struggled because, and some of you are struggling, not because of your new beginning, but because someone you're attached to took you into a beginning. It wasn't your idea. You're the family, you're the friend, you're the spouse. Uh, and so you're struggling, even though it wasn't your idea, you're struggling because they decided a new beginning and now that's all they're obsessed with. Now that's all they're dealing with. Now that's all they want to talk about. And you think, you know what? I can't be around you anymore. You were a fun person when you weren't in this stage of life. That's why people that stick with you and put up, all, put up with all your drama, put up with all your negativity, all your fear, all your anxiety, all your frustration, all your anger, People that put up with that because they know it's a beginning season and that's what it's doing to you. People that stick with you through that, I tell you, these people are keepers. So, so one of the gifts of new beginnings is you find out who your friends are. And in life, that's really important. Because friendship is overrated the way some people talk about it. Real friends are people that are there when it costs them to be there. And they should have left a long time ago like the rest of them did. But they see something in you others don't. So small beginnings are despisable, but whatever you despise can't bless you. Whatever you despise, whoever you despise, becomes of no value to you. We nullify the value of something in life that we go through if we despise it away from us. Despising anything, making something despicable in your eyes, gives you this separation from it. And you stand off it because you've taken that stance toward it or towards someone. And so God's saying to him and saying to us through him, do not make the mistake of losing the preciousness, of losing the miracle that's hidden inside beginnings by despising away because of the discomfort of the beginnings, because of the loneliness of a beginning, the isolation of a beginning, the three, the three steps forward, two back of a beginning, the loneliness, the sleepless nights, the prescription medication, all of that, the beginnings have an effect on you physically, beginnings affect your biology they don't just affect your finances they affect you as a person and now you're becoming affected in so many ways by the pressure and the fear and the agony of a new beginning but consider consider the preciousness the hiddenness the brilliance the miracle the genius the secrets that nobody stays long enough in the beginning to find out statistically i'm told that startups like my son-in-law startups in business entrepreneurial startups 90% or 95% of them don't make it beyond five years. Why? Because beginnings are so brutal. That's why. People think it's going to be easier than it is. And you can't forecast what might come your way that changes the ball game, changes the rules. And now you're set back when you thought it was all. Sometimes with beginnings, like my son-in-law, sometimes you think you're a way to go, it's great. Then a bill comes in the mail that you didn't anticipate because these are not the bills people get that work for someone else. Now your dream to do that yourself is different because now you're not just, you're not just you know, uh, you know, that's why you should be careful when people say, hey, look, your cakes, your cakes are the most delicious things I've ever tasted. You should open a cake shop. No, you should not. Because <laughs> within a year, 
you will hate the sight of cakes and you will be so fed up with staff health and safety rules regulations water shortage you'd be so fed up with paying rent paying a mortgage dealing with contractors dealing with businesses dealing with delivery systems you'll be so worn out because that's not that was not what you wanted to do you just wanted to bake cakes you love baking cakes I love baking cakes I'm a creative I'm a creative cake baking person but I hate my life don't even talk to me about cakes I hate my own cakes uh, because you made the mistake of thinking your friends say go for it go for it oh hang on a minute there's a lot more to the eye than starting a business and so some things you're involved in in this room today and, and all across the network that will hear this later and the network we're speaking to this morning the campuses listen some of the beginnings you are involved in honestly we desperately and I don't mean the church I mean humanity we need you to stay with it some of the things you're in the beginning of, they're going to become amazing in the difference they're going to make to people's lives. Not just your life, to other people's lives. And if you, if you are part of the 95% that don't make it, we'll never know. We will never know what it could have been. The world will never know what we could have had through you. So I need to come and be your beginnings coach today. I need to come and say, hey, don't quit. Would you, would, you, would you just go another day? Would you give it another week this week? This week when you, were, you had a plan this week. Some of you got a plan this week to shut it down. Would you just rethink it? Would, would today make you rethink shutting it down? Would you go another week and, and, and let's pray something happens this week that gives you a little nudge to say, no, 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 it's okay, keep going. I'm going to pray that for you this week. I'm going to pray that this week something happens that you know is completely supernatural that's God's way of saying, I got your back. Thank you. Small beginnings are tough. Look at Moses' beginnings. Whoa. Look at Joseph's beginnings. Whoa. Look at Jesus' beginnings. Whoa. You know, one of the blessings of small beginnings is you you learn to be less choosy than you are when you've got stuff. Uh, some of you are way too choosy because you can be. But when you're in a small beginning and people and resources are in short supply, you're just glad of help from anywhere. At one time, you were choosy who you'd get help from because you could afford to be picky. Now you're so desperate, you're glad of anybody looking you in the eye and smiling at you and helping you. And that's the gift of small beginnings. Small beginnings make you a better human. You stop being stuck up and snobby and thinking, well, I wouldn't talk to those people. Now you'll talk to anybody. I don't want to pick up a phone to them. Now you'll pick up a phone to anybody. Because you feel lonely and are looking for help and someone to believe in you and throw a crumb of belief and a crumb of investment and a crumb of helpfulness in your direction and that's the other gift of small beginnings because small beginnings are humbling and some of us need to be humbled because it's hard to be humble when you step into much you know when the Bible teaches in the parable of the talents that 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 God God rewarded them that the, the master in the parable of the talents he said he rewarded them because those that were faithful with little he said shall be given more so that they can be faithful with much those that are faithful in little will be faithful in much why because it's not hard to be faithful with much that's easy so God's not looking for faithful with much it's are you faithful in little because if you're faithful in a little the chances are more will come to you but if you're not faithful with little and despise being asked to do that if you despise being having to be faithful with little the chances are much will never come for you because if you are ungrateful and unkind and negative and depressed and confrontational and aggressive in little, guess what? You won't change when you get much. You know, money doesn't change mean people. People that get money that were mean when they had none are just more mean with more money. Money doesn't change your personality, doesn't change your character. So beginnings are massive. Beginnings are essential. Something brilliant is going on in beginnings and God wants us to know that so that we don't despise ourselves away from something that is that has come to completely change you as a person to make you a better human 
So I've got to hold you. I've got to hold you for a few moments in this beginning that you are terrified about and thinking God can't be in. Maybe I should quit. I've always been fascinated by what Jesus said in the book of Revelation when he said of himself, I am the Alpha and the Omega. He said, I'm the beginning and I'm the end. It seems a strange thing for someone to say who doesn't have beginnings and endings. Think about it. Omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence is immune from process. So God doesn't have beginnings and endings. We do. That's why, in, that's why in the beginning, in Genesis, God created beginnings and endings. He created morning and night and days and weeks and months. Not for God's benefit. He doesn't need that. God's immune from time. He's outside of time. So God created parameters and borders and timescales so that we, with seasons and so on, could navigate our lives. So for Jesus to say, I am the Alpha, the beginning, and I am the Omega, the end, strikes me something's going on here that is not easily seen on the surface of what he said. What I've come to realize about what he meant was that Jesus, God, in your life, is both the Alpha and the Omega at the same time. In other words, God in your life is not the Alpha today, the beginning. Then, years later, he becomes this bookend of an Omega in your life. And in between, God just waits to see what happens that he's going to be the Omega of. Because God doesn't wait for anything. Nothing ever occurred to God. God is not stuck somewhere waiting for information he doesn't have. God is not at a beginning hoping it turns out well for you. What many of you don't realize and will help you here with your beginning is that when God wrote the book of your life and Psalm 139 says all the days of your life written into God's book before one came to be. When God writes the book of your life, if the book of your life has a thousand pages God never starts with page one. He starts with page 1,000. So God writes your life from the end backwards. So when God enters your present, when God enters your life today, as it were, He never enters your life from the past. God only ever enters your life from the future, which is why walking with God can be so irritating. Because God enters your life from completion. So what you're crying about now and, and wanting ministry and prayer for and deliverance for and miracle for now, what you're crying about now, and believe your life's over, God knows a week from now you'll be laughing about it. I know. A week from now, the very thing you're begging him for, intervention, oh Lord, speak. are you blind? Lord, are you deaf? Me, help me, help me, help me, help me. God knows a week from now you'll be laughing telling you it's a funny story because it's because it's Sunday and you're in here you're depressed you're terrified you're thinking of quitting what you don't know is Wednesday you get a phone call now the phone call Wednesday is a game changer now God isn't waiting for Wednesday God's been in Wednesday so God knows Wednesday all changes but here's the, here's the annoying thing about God he doesn't tell you Huh? How unkind is that? God is very naughty. Sometimes God is very naughty. I've told him. It's not making a difference, but I told him. Would help, Lord, if you would give us a heads up that Wednesday's coming. God doesn't tell you about Wednesday because he wants to know how you're going to be in your small beginning. And if, if, if to be better in your beginning, you need to know about Wednesday, you're not going to make it. You've got to flourish not knowing about Wednesday. You've got to do well on Sunday, not just do well on Wednesday when it turns around. You've got to do well before it turns around. That's what makes you a better person, a bigger person, a better human. So I know we'd like it to come sooner, but God enters your life from completion. That's why God talks to you about things that haven't happened yet. And, and you're like, well, hang on a minute, God. I, I, that's not where I'm living. That's not where I am. So, so he's the, he is the omega of your life God is standing at the end of your life when you're still back here in your beginning 
So there's no middle for God. He just, he just shrinks them down both together. What I mean about that is this. If God is the end of your life, at the same time that he is in your beginning, if God is in all your endings, and there's many endings, there's many, there's many omegas in life, and many alphas, okay? I'm not just talking about the day you're born, the day you die. There are many alphas and omegas throughout your life. Some of them with very small gaps between them, some of them with longer time gaps. So if God, if God is, knows your omega, and he's in your alpha, so if God is fully aware of how this all pans out in your beginning, then what I want to say to you is all of your omegas, all of your endings are implicitly embedded in your alphas. With me? All of your outcomes are already built into your beginnings. In other words, so in your beginning, God is getting you ready for an outcome you don't know about. So God is working in and through you for an omega moment that's coming that he knows is coming, you don't. So in your alpha, God is getting you ready through the things you despise for an outcome that you would love to know about. But if you did, you would rush and despise and try and step away from the classroom called despising that you have to stay in for a while before you graduate. Some of you are trying to jump the class and fast track it. There's no fast track at this airport. You've got to line up with the rest of them and wait and be impatient and be grumpy and nothing's going to move for you. Nobody cares about you complaining because that's what beginnings are like. Nobody cares. You're on your own. You've got to gut it out. And God's saying, if you can survive this, if you get through this, then I know, I know there's an omega. I know, I know the outcome. Now, give me an example. You all okay? I've got a couple of minutes. Lord, help me. Um, I need a drink. Uh, g and T. The drink of champions. So, let's, let's go for David as an example. So, David's small beginning was very despisable. He's hated by his parents. He's hated by his brothers. He's despised so much he's shoved out of the way when the coronation is taking place. Don't even invite David. He's, he's a, he's a no-hoper. He's a teenager. One of the ideas about David, by the way, is that the reason he was despised too is because he was illegitimate. And he speaks about it in the Psalms. So the suggestion is that David was born outside of wedlock because his dad had a relationship with some other woman and he was born to this other woman and he was hated. He was the runt of the litter, hated by his family. And some say not only that, it stood out because David was a ginger. Seriously. Because the authorized, the authorized Bible says that when, when Goliath saw David, he saw that he was ruddy, meaning red. So maybe David was a ginger. Huh? All you persecuted gingers, high five. Huh? You have superpowers. David was one of your people, so now we all want to be ginger. Because he's the man. So consider David rejected, outcast, hated, despised. Goes to the battle, taking cheese sandwiches for his brothers. That's all he's doing, just an errand. Goes to the battlefront. While he's there, Goliath steps up. He hears Goliath shouting threats. Shows an interest in solving the problem. His brothers say, who do you think you are? Use your brother's sibling thing, shutting him down. Who do you think you are? You're not military. You're not a soldier. You've got no courage. You're not in the army. You're a kid. Get out of here. You're embarrassing us, is what they said to him. David, it says, ignored them, turned and talked to someone else, which is what you should do when people do that. Just turn and talk to someone else. Who is, not, who is not blind about you because they're so familiar with you. Familiarity is a massive blind spot. They see nothing in you because they've known you too long, like I said earlier. So David turns to someone else, these soldiers. Anyway, David's, David's openness about Goliath gets him in front of Saul, the king. So Saul says, well, you know, if you're determined to do this, he said, Saul, it'd be okay. You know, um, I was just caring for sheep and a bear and a lion came and I, I took them on by myself. Now, you know, Saul could have said, well, show me the footage. <laughs> Can you verify that? No, but David's saying, I think that the same God that helped me with that will help me with this guy, is how he put it together in his head. Because the, the way God guides your life, by the way, is by deja vu. For you to know whether it's God or not, 
Look for whether or not what's happening strikes a chord with something that happened previous in your life. God's guidance often owes more to deja vu than anything you've thought about. If something seems to be strangely familiar to some of the season of your life, it, which makes you just feel strangely ready and open to this, it's probably going to be God. That's so David thought, bear, lion, Goliath, different challenge, but kind of same God, same thing I'm feeling inside that I felt about them, that I feel about him. So Saul said, okay, here's the deal. Here's my armor, put my armor on, go in my armor, give you a chance. Now, you've got to know, Saul giving David his armor was not because Saul wanted him to succeed. Saul was a nasty person. Saul had a filthy heart. And, and no king, no king wants a teenager to upstage them. None of, none of the Navy SEALs in Saul's army would face Goliath, including Saul. So you don't want a kid, especially a ginger. You don't want a kid going out and taking down Goliath. It's embarrassing. So don't ever think that Saul's trying to help him. What Saul's trying to do is this. Saul, watch this carefully, Saul wants him to fail, but wants to be seen to have been helping him while he failed. If you fail in my armor, at least people will say, well, look how Saul tried to help him. No, 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 no. He knew he'd die. He hoped he'd die. But I want to be seen to have believed in him by a token armor I gave him. That's what's going on. So David said, no, thanks. I'll just go and stick with, listen now, I'll go and stick with what I learned in my alphas, in my small beginnings in that wilderness. In my small beginnings in that wilderness, I learned something. Now, what he learned in the small beginnings, get the band back up here, gives people hope we finished. <laughs> Hang on a few more minutes. Y'all okay? So, years in that wilderness, what you got to do all day? Few sheep, hardly very, hardly much concentration needed. Not a high maintenance job. What did he do for years? He wrote songs and did this all day. Sling and stone, all day. All day, years. He tells us in scripture that once people came to join David's army that was so good left or right with a sling and a stone, they could hit a human hair. The accuracy with a sling and a stone was like a sniper rifle in these people's hands. So years, years in this hated, despised, isolated life in the wilderness on his own. Years, what do you do? This, never knowing that this is what you'll need when this happens years later with this guy called Goliath. I've heard preachers say, don't play too loud, I'm not done yet. I'm, I'm out your way in a minute. Have a preacher say, the Holy Spirit leapt on the stone and guided it to Goliath's forehead. No, the Holy Spirit didn't need to do that. The Holy Spirit didn't need to help David. David was a crack forensic shot. He didn't need the Holy Spirit to get on the stone. David knew, you're going down, sucker. That's why he said to him, you're going down. And Goliath despised him and shouted at him, not knowing David had no intention at all of hand-to-hand -hand combat. He knew he wouldn't win. So David introduces a new form of warfare Goliath never saw coming because the boy's got no weapons. So Goliath's thinking, the boy's not even armed. It's ridiculous. So he said, you come to me with a stick? This is ridiculous. Him not knowing that this stick, this sling and stone, in this alpha beginning, in that alpha, was the omega God had planned for him. At the same time as God said, start here. Don't despise it. Don't hate it. Just keep doing that all day, every day, all day. Now when he gets to Goliath, David's like, ah, this is what that was about. All those years I thought, I'm hated, I'm not loved, I'm ginger. <laughs> All these years I was despised. I wonder what that was about, because I can do it with either hand. Now I get to this guy, I've, they're putting this armor on me, that's going to kill me. Get that armor off me. Everybody said, it doesn't make sense, it's crazy, it's suicide, don't do it, he'll take you out. He's a warrior, he's nine foot tall, he's like, ah, it's okay, watch this. One thing, the army was about, what in the world is that kid doing? Boom, boom, boom. 
all that happened in front of Goliath, God knew, was happening in his alpha. And if he despised his small beginnings, when he got here, he'd have had to practice. And I've got to tell you, I've got to finish. I've got to tell you, preparation, which you get time to do in beginnings. You don't get to prepare so much in the middle. You're too busy. Preparation in beginnings when nobody's calling you. You know, in anyone's phone book. No friends, no opportunity. You're on your own. Small beginnings, it's lonely. In that time of on your own, in your own company, learn to figure out why am I here? What am I growing in? What am I developing in? What am I becoming good at? Because somewhere that's going to come into its own a few months or years from now and you will be so glad that you didn't despise yourself away from this. Whatever this is for you. Whatever this is a metaphor for for you. This seemingly pointless, wasteful time that you're spending. You're becoming brilliant at something that you don't know God is already in the omega of that. And you're going to get to a place somewhere in your future where what you thought was a waste of time and you could have despised away from you. You're going to get to a place where you think, ah, oh, that's what that was. And you're going to say, uh, excuse me, I'm ready. Uh, excuse me, I can do that. Excuse me, uh, I think I'm ready to. And you're going to step up. And people are going to say, what? Who are you? Then they're going to hear you, see you, like you see some kid on South Africa's Got Talent. We just spent years in the bedroom. And then gets on stage like, whoa. Then they realize all of those lonely years. Now we realize that this omega moment on stage, this omega moment on history stage with David, all of that was in the alpha because he is the alpha and the omega in your life at the same time. All your endings are in your beginnings. All your omegas are in your alphas. And God knows that. So don't despise the day of small beginnings because God is getting you ready in your alpha for your omega. Let's stand together. Come on.